Well, last week I told you that we were just going to take a little two-week break. Uh, we've been in a summer series uh, going through the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, which is an interesting book in, in our Old Testament in a series called Chasing Satisfaction. And uh, I said, we're going to just hit the pause button. We'll return to Ecclesiastes next Sunday, and we'll, we'll finish that uh, around Labor Day. Uh, but we're going to be back in Zephaniah. And last week, Zephaniah posed a, a question for us to consider as we were studying uh, towards the end of that book. And that question was simply this, what does God think about you? Or, or to say it another way, what does God feel when he thinks about you? What, what is God's affection that he has towards those that put their hope in him? Because we all know there's a big difference between intellectually knowing someone loves you and feeling deeply that someone loves you. And so we spent last week really camped out in this amazing one verse in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. The Lord, Yahweh, your God, it's not just a God, it's your God is in your midst, a mighty one. In other words, a champion who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. That is deep emotional, affectionate language. He's not stoic. And yet he'll quiet you by his love, like, like, like a, a child rocking, like a parent rocking a young child to sleep. He will exalt over you, which literally means to, to spin, to twirl, to dance over you with loud singing. And we spent all of last week unpacking that. So if you, if, you did, if you missed last week, you can get that message online or on any of our social media platforms. But today, Zephaniah actually wants us to think about a second question. If, if, if last week's question was, what does God think about me? Today's question is, why do I exist? And I want to be really clear. Um, this is a question for every one of us. Whether you would say, I'm a devoted Jesus follower, that's why I'm here today. Or you would say, I got drugged to church today, or somebody's forcing me to watch online today. I, mean, I'm not, I don't even view myself as a religious person. I want you to know this question, regardless of your belief system, is the question that all of us need to wrestle with. And it is the question, kind of the flip side of last week's question, that the book of Zephaniah presses. So I'm going to tell you what Zephaniah is going to teach us. And it, it goes like this. You exist to worship, which, which means some of you, I, I know this because some of you are like, uh, okay, I'm in church. You're a pastor. Uh, of course, that would be like the, the Sunday school answer, right? I exist to worship. But I, I, like I said, even if you would view yourself as not a Jesus follower or not view yourself as a religious person, I want you to know, don't check out because when I say Worship matters. It matters because it's why you are alive on planet Earth. It's the reason at this moment you got another breath. You were created. You exist. Whether you're 12 years old or 95 years old or anywhere in between, you and I exist for the purpose of worship. And I think the reason why many of us even those of us that are in the church world, that almost sounds like the churchy thing to say. And those of us that are kind of the unchurch world, we're like, yeah, not interested. Before both of us check out, the Christians check out because they're like, we know that, duh, chief end of man is to glorify God, enjoy him forever, got that, learned that. And those of us that might not be followers of Jesus, we check out because we're like, I don't need to listen to a message about worship. Hang on. Because what we, I think part of our issue is how we unpack worship how we think about worship both in the church and outside the church. And we have some interesting ways that we actually think about worship. When, when I ask the question, what is worship? I want you to think of the way that sometimes we respond, how we think about it. Often, isn't it true, we think about worship as a place we go. We're going to church. What do we do at church? We worship at church. Or we think of worship as the singing portion of worship. I, I love to mess with people when sometimes people come up and say, oh, Matt, worship today was really good. And I go, wasn't Greg's sermon amazing? I agree with you. And then sometimes I really mess with them. They'll say, wasn't worship really going to go? Oh, you're not kidding, man. That parking team was incredible. People in kids ministry. 
And they're like, you're not tracking. I'm like, well, actually, you're not tracking. Because see, you're defining worship as equaling singing. And let's face it, usually when we say worship's good, it's because we sang a song you really like. We sang a hymn today. Worship was amazing. We sang the latest, greatest, cutting edge song today. Yes, worship was great. It was your favorite song. And we define it by music. And while it includes music, worship is not predominantly in the scripture ever defined as this thing we do for the first 20 minutes of a service called worship. What Tracy was doing when she was leading us is an act of worship. The question is, to who? For what? What's the purpose of it? But it's happening. Worship involves sometimes us using it more as an adjective, right? We talk about worship music. Like, I don't know, opposed to what other kind of music is there, if God's the author of music. <laughs> we talk about a worship team. So what does that mean? Like, I don't know what you all are doing on Sunday, but the worship team is getting their praise on. And we, we talk about a worship leader. I like that worship leader just led me into the presence of God. Really, I thought only Jesus could do that. I, I missed that part. We have an odd way of talking about worship. And the purpose of this is not to, to word police anybody. So if you come up and say worship was great, I, I'm probably not going to mess with you. But I do want us to think about it because I think often the reason that we have a hard time connecting, that the reason we exist, like it's not just a slice of life. So a lot of times we think of worship, it's like, okay, well, I have my personal life, my social life, my emotional health, my physical health, and of course I need to get a little worship slice. And what we're saying today is no, all of it is about worship. It's not one of the reasons you exist. It's not even at the top of the list. It is the list. Everything else is just an expression of that object of worship. And the question is, if we're all worshiping, then what are we worshiping? Who are we worshiping? But make no mistake about it, every one of us, regardless of our background, we were created, we exist to worship. We were made to amplify the value of something or someone else. And so here's how we can, no, go back to the next slide. Worship, go back one more, there you go. Worship is our response to something. When you think about worship, it is a response. When you say thank you to someone, what are you doing? You're responding to something they have done, who they are, what they've done. They give you a gift. You're such a kind, gracious person. That was a generous gift. I love the gift. Response, thank you. It's praise. Worship is always a response to something. It's always to something that is glorious, something that is great, something that is majestic. It's the reason that we watch Olympic games. We are responding to people we don't even know, but they're doing incredible things and we hear their story. This is who they are. It's incredible. And we respond. It's the reason we like sports. It's the reason that we like concerts. It's the reason that millions of Americans watch award shows when they're not nominated and they're not going to win anything. But I've been in a living room before when that movie that you love or that actor or actress wins and you're like, yes! Worship is a response to something that you esteem as valuable, as great, as glorious. It has weight to it. And it isn't a personality thing. And here's the thing. You can trail your time and affections and trace your allegiance, devotion, even money to a throne. And whatever's on that throne, that is the object of your worship. Uh, a number of years ago, when Taylor Swift came to Maryland in concert, uh, got to see her. I actually won tickets on 101.9. Two tickets, each ticket was 200 bucks. They were good seats. And here's what I discovered as 60,000 people packed a stadium. We had this going on. Because 60,000 people were responding with great intensity and passion. And you know what? Their money was their offering. With tickets selling what they were, and then you got to get the concert t-shirt, and that starts at $65. Why? Because I want to remember how great of an encounter and experience this was. That's worship. Worship is a response 
to something. And it's why we are drawn to it. It's why you love to be around greatness and glory. If you've ever seen a whale or a shark, I don't care what your temperament, what your Enneagram is, what your personality is. When you see, I've never seen somebody sees a giant whale, like go out of the ocean and they go, huh, yeah, whale. They go, whoa, did, did you see that? No, nobody said, when you see a creature very large jump out, get excited. They respond because they respond to glory, something great, something breathtaking. When you go to the Grand Canyon and you observe the beauty, you, people respond. Sometimes it's just like, wow. Get, we got to get pictures. This is, this, this, is, this is unbelievable. Nobody's going, oh, yeah, it's a giant hole in the ground. That's good. You are responding to glory, to majesty. And so let me give you a definition for those of us that call ourselves Jesus followers. We're just filling in the blank. Here's the definition of worship. Worship is our wholehearted. In other words, it's not external only. It's inside out. We're not just going through the motions. Wholehearted, all of life. It's not a segment. It is a lifestyle. And it is a passionate response to what? Here's the fill in the blank. To who God is and what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, whose life was changed. Oh, he was a worshiper. But it wasn't until he had an encounter with the greatness and glory and grace of Jesus Christ that all of a sudden, his response of great passion was devoted to Christ and not to other things. And here, he, he wrote letters to the church. And one of the letters that he wrote was to a church in Colossae. And in Colossians 1, listen to what Paul says. He says, for by him, talking about Jesus... All things were created. That means all of creation that you go, wow. He's like, I'm saying double wow because I'm fixed and focused on the creation is pointing me to a creator and his name is Jesus. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. In other words, everything. And here it is. All things were created through him, through Jesus, and for him, everything. In another place, when he wrote to uh, a place in Corinth, he said, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, that's a big fill in the blank. Whether you work, whether you play, whether you work on your, your, your garden, whatever, whatever you do, do in a response. Do all in a way that brings glory to Christ. This, this is the reason you and I exist. As a matter of fact, David, if I could say it this way, you were conceived for the purpose of worship. D David says it this way in Psalm 139. For you formed my inward parts. You, God, knitted me together in my mother's womb. But listen, look at the response. I praise you. Why do you, why do you give him God praise? For I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. See, his point is this. If I look in the mirror and I'm evaluating, I don't like my nose. It's too flat. It's too pointy. It's too big. What he's doing is he's looking at his nose and going, a nose, that is crazy. How did God come up with the concept? Fingers, there's, there's like five of them. And this one's different than the other four. And yet they work together. Wow! Well, what do you and I most of the time do? Oh, we're worshiping. We, we look in the mirror and we worship something else, which is why we go, I hate the way I look. Because now, instead of seeing it go to the creator and being all of him and his majesty, it focuses on ourselves. You see, when the train wreck of humanity happened, worship didn't cease. It just jumped track. And went to something else. The Apostle Paul said it this way to another church at Rome. He said, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. And here it is. This is worship. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God. In other words, God off the throne for something else on the throne. For images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals. 
And some of us were like, well, we're sophisticated Americans. We're not, we're not worshiping statues. Oh, no, we worship other images. What, what do we go to to get some, some, some joy? I got six likes, yes. Let me see who's following me. Let me see who liked that tweet. Or we see things and it discourages us. Images, nothing wrong with this, but see images that are created things are to ultimately draw our attention to the response of worship to the creator. And what Paul says is, you know where it all went wrong? We exchanged glory of God for the glory of other things. But make no mistake about it, it's still worship. That's why regardless of what you believe, you're still a worshiper. And every moment of every second of every day, you and I prove how passionate of worshipers we are. Because worship is a response to something that is great and glorious. And an idol is the substitute. Here's the definition of an idol. An idol is anything that captures and absorbs our hearts and lives more than God. It doesn't mean we don't enjoy good gifts. We do. It just means those good gifts should ultimately drive our attention to a great and glorious good God. Or to say it another way, idolatry, which is another form of worship, the wrong kind, idolatry is finding our ultimate purpose and satisfaction in created things rather than the creator. And Zephaniah is a book that unpacks where worship goes wrong. Because worship matters because it's why you and I exist. And so just to kind of remind ourselves, Zephaniah... He's referred to as a minor prophet, not because he's less than the other major prophets. It's just he wrote a smaller book. Whereas uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah, they wrote, they wrote like 40, 50, 60 chapters of a volume for their, for their work. Uh, Zephaniah just wrote three chapters, if you will. And Zephaniah's name is really important. It means the Lord has hidden. It's this idea of God is my, my defense. And he spoke during the reign of King Josiah. And you know what King Josiah was passionate about? Restoring true worship back to people. Why? Because they were giving themselves to everything and all other things other than God. In other words, they were still worshipers. It's just worship went wrong. And and Zephaniah, who's a prophet, a messenger of God, along with King Josiah, they are trying to restore and bring reform back to God's people as well as the surrounding nations. And, and in those three chapters, if you just want to kind of get the quick outline, it goes like something like this. God will judge within. That means his people. So those of you that are like, yeah, I'm tired of these church people, man. They need to clean up their own act. God says, I totally agree with you. That's why I always start with judgment begins first in the house of God. That's where it begins in Zephaniah. So he's talking to the people, Jerusalem and Judah, and there's a lot of woes to them. But, oh, it covers everybody. Because remember, we're all worshipers. God will judge around, meaning the other nations. So there's a lot of judgment in the book of Zephaniah in three chapters. But... Here's where it concludes. God delights to show his unfathomable love and radical grace to all, meaning the religious people and the non-religious people who put their trust in him. And so Zephaniah, the prophet, the King Josiah, what are they about? They're wanting about to see worship clearly defined and clearly restored. And so that's why this theme deals with worship. We rewind the clock and we go all the way back to verse 1 of Zephaniah chapter one, chapter 3, verse 1. And when you get a woe, you know that's serious. Woe to her, that is the term for this city, this community of the people of God, Jerusalem, Judah. Woe to her who is rebellious, so this is judgment from within, and defiled the oppressing city, she, meaning the city, listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. And here we have the worship claim. She does not trust in the Lord. That's the word Yahweh in Hebrew. She does not draw near to her God. And the Hebrew word here for draw near is intimacy and joy. In other words, they don't find intimacy and joy in God. At best, they're just going through the form. 
And, you know, Jesus rebuked the religious leaders of his day, the, the Pharisees, quoting Isaiah. And he says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is in vain. Same, same concept that's taking place here. Notice when worship goes bad, everything goes bad. Look at verse 3. Her officials, this is the, the civil leaders, her officials within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave nothing to till the morning. The idea here is they exploit their power, they don't care about the people, and they don't protect the vulnerable. But now we have a critique of the most religious people. This would be like the, the pastors of the day, the ministers of the day. Her prophets... So, so those of you that have issues with the church and you're like, man, I'm so tired of hearing about all the, the abuse that takes place and spiritual abuse in the church. Guess what? You and God have a lot in common. He's tired of it too. And he addresses it here. Her prophets, these are the people that are supposed to speak faithfully God's word, are fickle, treacherous men. Her priests, priests were about protecting the purity of worship. So it wasn't just external form. It was from the inside out. You were just going through the motions her priests profane what is holy, what is set apart. They do violence to the law. In other words, they're not worshiping according to God's precepts. But then, notice Zephaniah wants us to have a clear distinction between the corruption of the people, even the people inside the walls of the church, and God himself. And I think that's a really important distinction for all of us to make. And notice what he says, the Lord, Yahweh, within her is righteous. In other words, don't blame God because God's not like those people. He does know just, injustice. Every morning he shows forth his justice. Each dawn he does not fail, but the unjust knows no shame. What is he saying? Don't turn away from God because of what you see, quote unquote, religious people do. Because God's not like that. You've heard the expression, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't throw the one who created you out because of the corruption you see that often happens in his name. Because God says, woe to that. It's a firm act of warning and justice and judgment. Verse 9 says this, for at that time, so judgment is coming. Justice is coming. And just when you think, well, there's no hope, we're all doomed. Behold who God is and behold what God will do. For at that time, I, this is the Lord talking through Zephaniah, I will change. In other words, they're not going to change. They're stubborn. If there's going to be any transformation, it's going to have to start with me doing something in their hearts that will produce the result of true worship. I will change the speech of the people to a pure speech that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve me with one accord. What do you notice here? God initiates based on who he is, what he's going to do, and he brings about inward transformation. So in worship is about the heart overflowing into all of life so that they call on his name and notice it's a lifestyle. It's all of life. And they serve him. And they serve him as a community that is united. What does it say? With one accord. That's why I buy Hondas. One accord. From behind the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. In other words, those that are exiles, those that are far away, he says, oh no, they're not going to be left out. I'm going after them. Because they are my worshipers. I'm going to restore their worship. And notice what are they going to do? They're going to bring an offering that is pleasing. An offering that celebrates who I am and what I have done in their lives. Notice worship is about our lips and worship is about our lives. It involves our whole, whole being. And then verse 11 says this. On that day... You, this, this is incredible. You shall not be put to shame. But notice the guilt lies with us because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. In other words, this is God saying, you have every right to be put to shame, but I am not going to do that. 
For then I will remove from your midst your proudly exalted once, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain, but I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly, and here's worship, they shall seek refuge. What was Zephaniah's name? What did it mean? The Lord has what? Hidden. Do you see what he's doing? They will be hidden. They will find their defense. They will seek refuge in the name of the Lord Yahweh. In other words, there is a coming judgment and yet God steps in front of his people and he shields them and he protects them from it. And God takes that judgment and he absorbs that consequence. And we know he does that through Jesus by sending Jesus to a cross so that because of what Jesus did on the cross, standing in our place, dying as a substitute for our sin, bearing the wrath of God on our behalf, God can confidently say to us, yep, no shame for you. Why? Because I'm sending my only son to bear your shame, to take your blame so that everything about you becomes new and everything that separated you and was a barrier from you worshiping me, it is removed. That is what God himself has done because that is who God is. And what flows out of that? Worship. The response to all of that, the wholehearted, all of life, passionate response to who God is and what he's done. And so verse 14 gives us our response. This is what God tells his people in light of who I am, in light of what I've done. I mean, just imagine, imagine if you're guilty and you have to go to trial and you know, I don't have a, I don't have a prayer. And the judge renders a verdict. Not only says you're not guilty, but says, hey, you want to be part of my family? Somebody else is going to pay and do your time for you. Someone else will take the death sentence for you. I think that would affect you emotionally because that's what worship is, a response to something. And notice what he says. He says to the people, he says, so, so sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Did you know that there are over 500 references in the scriptures to singing? And out of 500 references, 50 of them are direct commands where God exhorts and tells his people, I want you to sing. And most of the time, he wants loud singing. And, and, and I know, if I just talk to, to the men for a moment, because I don't know, I am once, so I, I get it. Sometimes when we think about singing, what's our, come on, let's just be honest, let's be real. Our, our pushback is, I'm not a singer. I don't, you know, I, I'm just not wired that way. And the issue is not, are you a singer? The issue is, do you have a song? See, when you have a song, as Psalm says, when, when God puts a new song in your heart, a, 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 an act of praise re erupts. Many see and fear and put their trust in him. Talking about concerts, I've been to enough concerts to know that those who would not view themselves as singers, they do sing. When they have a song, a couple years back, uh, Billy Joel did the first concert, you know, playing piano, you've got to be into Billy Joel, uh, did the first concert at M&T Stadium. And Greg used to tease me because he would say, you know, Matt, M&T uh, Stadium is, is, people go there for football. It took a music concert to get you to there. That's the only time I've ever been since or before. Billy Joel was there. And you know what I noticed as 45,000 people or whatever was in there? And he played this song. And I think some of you probably will know it. And you know what he did? He had everybody say, oh, sing us the song. You're the piano man. Sing us the song tonight. And you know what? 45,000 people of quote unquote non-singers were belting it out passionately. And you're like, well, they probably had a few. Well, they maybe did. But they still had the song. And in that moment, that song was connecting with everything in them. 
And they didn't give a rip what anybody thought around them. They weren't self-conscious. They were, I mean, it was like a thunderous 45,000 choir. And you know what? Hands are up. They're going like this. Sing us the song, you know, the piano, man. And no one was going, this is kind of weird. Because worship was happening. Worship is a response to glory, to greatness, to when you have a song. And that song points you to hope and something that you go, I love this moment. This is a special moment. And you want to give another offering? Let's buy a $65 t-shirt to remember it. It is the response. It is the response. And notice it goes on and sing aloud. And then it says, shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exalt. This word exalt has the idea of spinning around. Like just kind of looking ridiculous. With all your heart. With all of your heart. See, praise is not praise until it's expressed. Let me say that again. Praise is not praise until it's expressed. Thanks is not communicating thanks until you say thank you. Parents, you know about trying to teach your kids to say thank you? One of the things I would say when my kids were younger, I'd be like, did you say thank you? Yes. Did they know you said thank you? Uh, I think. Well, let me give you a rule of thumb. Unless the person says, oh, you're welcome, you didn't give thanks. If they respond back saying, oh, you're welcome, my, pl- my privilege, whatever, then you know you have expressed gratitude. If not, you've mumbled it. <laughs> Thank you. What? I said thanks. And when we give thanks, what are we giving thanks? For who the person is, how kind of them to care enough about me to want to bless my life and for what they've done. They gave me a gift. They are worshiping. Guys, I have been in living rooms, and I'm not a sports guy, but I, you know, I go there for the food. Uh, and I have seen growing men, I've seen an accountant go like this when, when, when a football game, when a play happened, they stood up on the couch and went, yeah! They were an accountant. Explain that. And if you're an accountant, I'm not just picking on you. I'm just, you know, you just typically don't think of accountants as just going crazy. But you know what? I've watched grown men fist bump, high five, hug each other, and they're in the living room. Like, dude, they're not even at the game. They're watching it on the screen. They don't know these people. These people don't know them. But they are finding exuberant joy. They're jumping up and down. And no one's saying, this is kind of weird. Let's tone it down. Don't, don't, you're getting too emotional. See, I don't want to get caught up in being emotional and being fanatics. Nobody cares. They're worshiping. They're responding to something great. That's what worship is. The problem is when that gets our affections and then the God of all glory who gave his son for us gets, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. That's worship gone bad. And that has nothing to do with your temperament, your personality, I'm shy. That is about something in the heart is not connecting with the truth of who God is and what he's done. Because when you connect with that, listen, I've done funerals, weddings. When people connect the truth, I watch grown men weep like babies and they don't care. I watch grown men laugh hysterically. I, I hear them shout and celebrate when something connects and it's real to them. And the question is, not are we worshipers, but what are we really worshiping? What has our affections? What is getting our amplification of praise? And then I love this part, the Lord has taken away judgments against you. It's like God says, I, you got a reason to shout. Do you have any idea of the consequences of how you have sinned against me, the way I should treat you? And I've absorbed that. You're free. The weight of guilt and shame is removed. Oh my goodness. Like, do you actually believe that? Because if you do, you don't keep your hands in your pockets. Those hands go up. You sing, you dance, you shout. And sometimes you just get on your knees and you say nothing because you are in the presence of an awesome God. 
So this isn't about a checklist. Well, let's see. Let's get a hand up here and should do a little clapping. It has nothing to do with that. It's about the engagement of your heart. Is it just words or is it God? And then it, he says, the king of Israel, the Lord, Yahweh, he's in your midst. You, you know what I think of? You ever see those, those, those commercials, well, not really commercials, but little videos where a military mom or a military dad's been away for like a year and a half, two years, and they surprise their son or daughter at school? They get me every time. And, and you see them. And they, you know, they always surprise, they sneak up and that little daughter sees her dad. And you know what I've never seen in any of the videos based on any personality or temperament, including the boys. Oh, hey dad, good to see you. Hey mom, yeah. Uh, I'm just introverted, just, it's just, just my personality. Nope, sorry, that's not human. Worship's a response to something awesome. And in that moment, seeing their dad, seeing their mom is awesome. And in front of their whole school, they embrace and they cry, they weep, they cling on. And no one's going, that's kind of weird. That's just a little, you're getting emotional. Everyone's joining in with that because they're seeing glory. Even if that wasn't your mom or dad, you're affecting, which is why when I watch it, I'm affected. Because worship is the response to glory. It's the response of who God is. He's in your midst. And what I love about this is this God who's in our midst. Notice what he does. Notice his response back. Everything that he told us in verse 14, we do to him. This is God's response to us. That's why we started at this verse last week and worked backwards. The Lord, your God, Yahweh's in your midst. A mighty one who will save. He, this is God. He's going to rejoice over you, over me. What, what makes God happy and excited? Being with you. Loving you with gladness. He, and, and, and guess what? He takes delight in quieting you with his love, like calming a child that's had a nightmare. He's not lecturing you. He's not saying, go back to bed. Just put your trust in me. What's your problem? He's not faulting you for you having such weak faith. He just says, come here. It's okay. And he says nothing, but he comforts you with his love. And then this word, same word is used in verse 14 about spinning, exalting, kind of looking a little crazy. God says, that's what I do over you. And why does God say sing, 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 sing loudly, sing loudly, sing loudly? Guess what? Your God is a singing God and he sings loud. Do you know what makes him sing loud? You do. He cares about you so much. He loves you that much. And this isn't just an Old Testament thing. The New Testament writers talk about Jesus leading singing. Both in Matthew's gospel and Mark's gospel, as communion is, the last supper is done and the cross is, is about to happen very soon, Jesus leads his disciples in a time of singing. The writer of Hebrews says it this way, quoting from Psalm 22, which is a messianic psalm. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, here's, he's quoting Psalm 22, but he's referring it to Jesus. He says, I, Jesus, will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. That means the congregation, the church. I will sing your praises. You know who the worship leader is? Jesus says, I'm going to lead you all in the song, the song of salvation. The song that I accomplished on your behalf, I'm going to lead out on that. Because I represent the Father in all perfections who delights over you and sings. And in case you just think that's one thing that the writer of Hebrews picked up, the apostle Paul, remember him? He says something very similar in the book of Romans. He says, for I tell you that Christ has become a servant of, the, of Jews on behalf of God's truth so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed. And moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So both Jew and Gentile, religious, non-religious, are going to worship. And then he, he says, as it is written, and this time he's quoting Psalm 18, Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles, talking about Jesus, I will sing the praises of your name. And in case you just think I'm just like twisting things up, 
The great theologian and and Bible scholar, Dr. D.A. Carson, commenting on the book of Romans says this, behind and before the single mouth by which believing Jews and Gentiles glorify God, that means worship him, is the mouth of the Messiah singing who makes known the name of God to them. You see, when we encounter the unfathomable love of God and the radical grace of God, there's only one response. And it's the response that you were made for, you exist for. You will find your greatest joy and satisfaction and delight in, in responding by giving worship, not to created things, not to images, but ultimately to the creator. So that whether you eat, whether you drink, whatever you're doing, watching football, playing golf, whatever, that becomes an act of worship and not just 15 minutes of singing. When you leave this service, worship's going to continue. When you hang out and go to lunch, worship is happening. When you go to work tomorrow, you're a worshiper. What are you responding to? What am I responding to? Here's the takeaway. Worship is our wholehearted, all of life, passion and response to who God is and what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. So CFC, not because I'm telling you, not because Greg would tell you, not because it's a temperament or you're just a little more extreme. You want to be a Bible people? That's Bible. Want to be a Jesus following people? This is Jesus, a singing God. And he says, look at who I am. I want to put a song in your heart. Whether you know the song, but I got a song for you. And that song, the response is, sing it loud. And you can express your whole self. Those hands can move up just a little bit because you're just saying, I'm in the presence of God. And it's no longer about who's around. It's about the reality of the one who inhabits the praises of his people, and that is King Jesus. So can I invite us, if you're able, let's stand. And this time, when I say worship, don't just think let's sing. We are going to respond to who God is and what he has done for us in Jesus Christ. And we'll do that through a song. Let's stand together. Lord, I pray that...